Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Open Mic. Our next guest is a strong advocate for prosecutors' offices having integrity units that look seriously into wrongful conviction cases. Our guest says that it is imperative that those units have the authority and independence to make crucial decisions when they believe someone innocent is locked up. She is also a sharp critic of some shoddy police work around the country that leads to false confessions and improper imprisonments. Let's welcome Marissa Boyers Bluestein, the assistant director of the Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice with the University of Pennsylvania, Cary School of Law. Truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's what you're going to hear on my podcast, Open Mic. I'm going to tell you things that most lawyers won't tell you. We expose the truth and bring you justice. I want you to go for the win in law and in life. Hi there. Hi there. Thanks so much for having me on. It's my pleasure. That was a mouthful. It is a mouthful, <laughs> but you did it right. So right, well, I, I said everything right. All right. Well, that's a good thing. You know, these conviction integrity units, and, and it sure sounds like you're you're an expert on this. You know, we've talked about them a little bit on this show. Mm -hmm. but there's such. I remember the first time I learned about them. Um, they were just so fascinating to me. So, just for our, our listeners and viewers who are not familiar with a conviction integrity unit, CIU, I guess we can call them from the rest of the show. Um, can you explain what they are? Sure. So sometimes they're called conviction integrity units, sometimes conviction review units or a post conviction review unit, but generally they are units within a prosecutor's office, independent units, hopefully outside the trials, the trial side or the appellate side. And that what they do is they review cases of alleged innocence. So if somebody says, I was convicted of a crime I did not commit. This is a unit within the prosecutor's office that conducts an independent investigation of those claims, reviews the case, and tries to determine whether or not that's true. And if they determine that the person who wrote to them is in fact innocent, then they actually will go to court with defense counsel and ask that that conviction be vacated and the individual released, or in other words, exonerated. And we started off in 2009, I would say, with the first couple of units. In 2016, my center did a report on the existing units at the time. There were 24. There are 101 today. So this so what, isn't something that's going away. No, and it's fabulous. Um, but but I want I could try to explain it, but I'd rather have you explain why this is so kind of bizarre. And because and, I remember the first time I heard about it, it was like, what? It's like the chicken in the hen coop or the, you know, something like that, something like yeah. that analogy, um, because that's like a prosecutor saying, I want you to look at my prosecutors that I employ to make sure that, that they're not, that they're not running roughshod over the defendants, that they're doing everything right, that the convictions are legit, that we just spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on to, con to convict somebody, mm -hmm. but I want you to make sure that they're right. Like, why is that so weird? Well, let me ask you this, Mike. What do you think the job of the prosecutor is? Well, I think they, they'll tell you it's to seek justice. Okay. Right? Okay. And Yes, exactly. It's not to get convictions. It's not just to kind of push through. It's to seek justice. Well, what if that justice doesn't come to light until 20 or 30 years after a conviction? The prosecutor is still duty bound, ethically bound to do something about it. So the prosecutorial function that we say doesn't end at conviction and incarceration. It continues. It and always continues to ensure that justice is complete. The problem that we've had since about 1995 is this idea of finality of a case has become so prominent in the criminal legal system that it has kind of silenced out innocence and justice. And with conviction integrity units in particular, what they're really doing is bringing justice back into the discussion, not to 
push out finality altogether and certainly not to push out victims rights because they need to be protected but because justice is the pursuit and that's what these units are really about and so the enlightened prosecutors who really aren't out just for convictions and you and i could sit here and argue all day that a lot of them that's really what they're out for but let's just give them the benefit of the doubt that they took an oath and they're there for justice um they are taking that all seriously. And like you said, 20, 30 years later, um, if they have credible evidence that they should dig into, they may say, you know what? But my, usually it's a, a, a former prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Usually it's not the one still right. in office, usually, for the usually. cases I've seen. And they say they made a mistake or there was some, I mean, something more than a mistake. Maybe it was something intentional. I've seen some of those, you know, some, some police officers, some right. detectives, some prosecutors were, were not acting ethically. And I think that this person is, is, is innocent. And right. then and go ahead. That's right. And so it, but even innocence is one thing, right? Well, we can actually prove innocence or come very close to proving innocence with DNA or other strong evidence of actual innocence. But there are also many cases where we can't get quite that far, but we can show this person was wrongly convicted. They should not have been convicted because of, like you said, bad evidence, bad um, you know, misconduct on part of the prosecutor or just error on part of the prosecutor or the police or even the judge. And you know, looking back to undo those convictions does take you know, kind of political power and it's a risk because the person in a wrongful conviction case, as opposed to an innocence case, may have been involved. We don't, maybe we don't know the answer to that question, but we know they should not have been convicted. And a, most of the CIUs and CRUs that I work with all around the country will look at both of those cases, both the manifest injustice, the person who should not have been convicted, and the person who's potentially or actually innocent. It takes a lot of humility and bravery in my opinion, to have a prosecutor do this. And it could potentially cost the state millions and millions of dollars for one wrongful sure. conviction to be overturned. Well, shouldn't it? You're talking about... Right. Right. Absolutely. Uh, right. But you know, King, this is a voluntary thing. How many prosecutor's offices are in there in this country? There's about got 6,000. 6,000. 6, mm -hmm. There's 100 units. Well, that's important. That's interesting and important. It is interesting. And important. <laughs> There's 100 out of 6,000 offices. That's right. I mean, I'm not the best mathematician. That's not even a percent. It's, that's less than a 10th of a percent. It is. And, and but uh, I'm the, I'm the glass is half full, right? I'm even a, like, there's a tiny little bit of water left in that glass. So what I look at is the growth, right? I've seen you know, a threefold increase just since we looked at this issue back in 2016. And that's not small. And then I hear every day, every day from prosecutors' offices around the country who want to do this but don't have the resources. We don't fund it. We don't give them money to be able to do it. And that's a huge issue with smaller jurisdictions. Interesting. We had a we had the Oakland County prosecutor on I'm sorry, the Oakland County, well, the Oakland County, I did two interviews on open mic, the open County, the sitting Oakland County prosecutor said, uh, Jessica Cooper, we don't need a conviction integrity yeah. unit because my office is amazing. And then we had the uh, challenger um, McDonald come up and say, oh no, we're doing a conviction integrity unit. And I've heard some grumblings. I don't know if she's actually set hers up yet or not. Kevin will type, type me a note if she has or hasn't, but she's in the process. I hope to, to do that. Um, and you know, I love that you're hearing, uh, new ones pop up all the time, but it is really important in my opinion that, that those numbers go up. So in five years, there's a hundred of them. And I think that the numbers have got to start skyrocketing if we want true justice. But again, this is, it, it you know, you have to have a, some political clout to, to pull this and you have to really really, really want this. And you have to be in a jurisdiction that really, really wants this. It, it's true. And I think that you know, what we've seen less and less and less of are what my you know, colleague would call a conviction review in name only or a crino, whereas a unit that's set up just to kind of you know, give political cover. 
but they don't actually do anything, right? They don't actually exonerate. They don't change policies. They don't look at how they, to prevent wrongful convictions from happening in the first place. They just kind of it stick some lipstick on it and say they're done. F much, much less of that. What I see now are people who are really intentional about it, who want to set up good units and who are looking for help. The problem is that that help is hard to find. And that's kind of where we step in from the Quattrone Center. We provide that help. We provide that that background for people so we can help them ensure that they are creating a unit that follows best practices and isn't just kind of thrown together. So I want to hear what you guys do in the aid, but I just want to say, so Karen McDonald is opening one this October, 2021. Kevin Dietz just told me great. that's great and important. And hopefully she'll reach out to you for the advice you give these offices. So why don't you now tell me how you assist these offices and we could send this on over to Karen McDonald so she can uh, sure. make like, sure she does it right. Happy to be in touch with her. Um, so what we do is I will reach, I will often reach out. I think I've probably already reached out to Karen um, and others. As soon as I hear about a unit, I'll reach out and I'll say, look, we can help you. I can help you. I can help you think through what the infrastructure is going to look like. I can help you think through how many people you're going to need or whether you can use part timers. I can help you think through your policies. What kind of cases are you going to review? How are you going to review them? What is your application process going to be? Who are you going to work with? I can help you answer those questions. We have templates. We have policies. We have all kinds of materials that are available for conviction review units that are starting up. We've made them publicly available. There's a website we set up called convictionreview.net where anybody can go to find out what is the best practice? How do I do this in the right way that will be the most effective way? And that is, is what I do. And I meet with prosecutors uh, sometimes once a month and kind of check in and see how they're doing, answer questions, give feedback. I connect them with other offices within uh, innocence organizations. And I really, we really try to help give them that support of, to be able to get going. So they're not just kind of, they're wandering around in the dark. We really do provide that light for them and we help them along the way. Fabulous. So they all for free. I might they add, it's just, they don't have to different. reinvent the wheel. I mean, exactly. that's, that's amazing. So who are some of the exemplary units around the country that are already set up? Well, the, you know, we work very strongly with, you've met, I think Val Newman, or at least you've yeah. heard you Wayne work County. with her certainly in Wayne County, um, very young unit, but has just her dedication to, Ensuring transparency in the process and integrity in the process is just something to be held, you know, quite in esteem. Suffolk County, New York, same thing. Dallas County, Philadelphia, um, in many units in Florida, in Jacksonville, we've worked with them. And the, what you'd be surprised by is just the, the dedication of these people to getting it right, to doing it right. And not just about the cases, but getting the process right, being transparent to the constituency, being transparent to the people who are applying, being independent, not being, not having to go to the appeals unit or the trial unit to check in, <clears throat> pardon me, but being able to make that decision and move forward with the elected, it's really inspiring to kind of see that around and they help each other and they, they really work together. So we see it all over the country. Absolutely. We see terrific units forming and move, I had a wonderful discussion this morning with the head of the Davisville County, that's Nashville, Tennessee unit, they had their second exoneration that you know, they're working towards some other cases that may resolve soon. But importantly, it's so one thing, Mike, and I'm, I didn't know I'm talking a lot, but it, it's more than just exonerations. What I think that that folks in the media get wrong is they're looking at exonerations as like, does this unit work or does it not? But the unit does so much more than that. They look at wrongful convictions and they try to get justice for people who have been wrongly convicted. But doing it right, they're trying to prevent it from happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. They're revising their policies. They're revising their training. They're looking at Brady lists, which are lists of officers or, or prosecutors who've been involved in misconduct. They're trying to prevent those errors. You know, that's what a good unit does. That is a unit that is working and working well. Done right a conviction review unit can actually be the beating heart for justice at a prosecutor's office. And those are the offices that we like to work with most. And done wrong, what, what does that set us up for? Done wrong, it's false hope, and which is the worst kind of situation. And I think it's no secret. I worked in Philadelphia with the unit before the current um, district attorney took a, well, actually, even before him, the first time the unit was set up, it was one person. He was set up 
he'd been a career pro um, homicide prosecutor. And within about six weeks of his appointment, he also took on a second responsibility of looking at uh, corruption in Harrisburg, our state capital. So it's kind of like what Joe Biden says about priorities, right? Don't tell me your values, show me your budget, and I'll tell you your values. Mm -hmm. If you hire somebody to run a unit and then immediately cut his time in half, that you don't value that unit. And that unit did nothing. Mm -hmm. But then when our current, our that district attorney you know, went to the federal prison and others took over the office, the unit started changing, brought in more people, it was more transparent, had more power. And now, of course, when, when Mr. Krasner came in as district attorney, he brought in um, a new unit director, Patricia Cummings. Now they have, I think, 10 lawyers in that unit. It's strong and it's robust. So you can see it kind of change over time. But a, a bad unit just gives people false hope that their cases are going to look at when they're not, and in fact, can do a lot of harm for an actually innocent person. So um, imagine you you were on a Zoom call or giving a speech to the 5,900 prosecutors who don't have integrity units how do you convince them to put aside the politics of, of, you know, mistakes that might have happened or been made in the past in favor of doing the right thing? What's, what's your best pitch? No one wants to get it wrong. No one. Prosecutors don't want to get the wrong guy. Victims certainly don't want to get the wrong guy. No one wants to get the wrong guy. We want to make sure we're doing it right. But the best way to prevent it from happening is to learn from the past because every office is different. Every office makes mistakes. There's no fairy dust around any prosecutor's office that protects it from wrongful convictions, but they all have them. So the issue is you have to understand how they've happened in order to prevent them from happening in the future. We need to do things like they do in the airline industry um, or the transportation industry, where when there's an error, we learn from it. We don't go around and poke, point fingers at each other. It's not bad cop, no donut. We need to look at the system how did the system allow this error to occur and how do we prevent it from happening in the future? So for me, the pitch to the prosecutor's office is we all want to get it right. Let's make sure that we're getting it right going forward by learning how we got it wrong in the past. All right. So, you know, I'm sure, I mean, you, you before we went on air, you, you showed me a picture of 17 innocent people that you helped get out of prison, which I commend you for and congratulations. And that's great work. Um, but there's a lot of common threads. And I'm curious in your experience and your broad experience, what are the biggest problems that you see in these wrongful convictions? So we often talk about kind of factors that lead to a wrongful conviction. We talk about eyewitness misidentifications. We talk about um, false confessions. We talk about forensic error. Uh, and all of those are fairly you know, in the light. We know about those and we're working to correct those. Some of the ones that are hidden are on the more uh, prosecutorial misconduct or police misconduct side. So in some states, like Pennsylvania, <clears throat> if a prosecutor doesn't hand over exculpatory information, even though they're constitutionally bound to do so, and they keep it in their file, there is probably a very strong likelihood that will never be uncovered. Because under our post-conviction laws, there's no discovery allowed, discovery just being information that's provided from one party to another. And our so-called so right to know laws or Freedom of Information Act excludes anything to do with a criminal investigation, which means a prosecutor never has to open their file ever unless they choose to do so. So when while whereas we have a number of, of factors which we know about and which we can actively engage to prevent something like prosecutorial error, Brady, Brady errors or Giglio errors, these, they're pervasive. And then we have courts who don't understand the issues when they come in front of them and don't want to hold prosecutors accountable. And so they look for other ways to decide a case and or they say, oh, no, yes, they should have handed it over, but it's harmless error and you know, which just perpetuates the issue. And so we need to really start thinking about prosecutors. Um, you know, we have this absolute immunity doctrine, which I know you're very you're familiar with. And for the folks who don't know, it just means that prosecutors cannot be sued cannot be sued in court for what they do, even if you had a bad actor who lied, who stood up in front of a judge and lied or lied to a jury or intentionally withheld evidence, which is extraordinarily rare. But even if you had that, that person cannot be sued liable. You can't recover from that. So there's no learning from that. Nope. Our civil system is wonderful for teaching us about errors in our systems. 
that's how we fix things. We fix things from product liability, from product liabilities or from medical mal malpractice. We learn how to fix the system. If we don't allow recoveries in the criminal legal system, it's much harder to learn how to fix it. So we know we have to get rid of the absolute immunity doctrine. We have to encourage prosecutors to engage in open file discovery, share the information they have, all the information they have from prosecutors, from police, from forensics. We have to encourage judges to hold prosecutors accountable when they do see misconduct. That whole area of the system is so, so bogged down and so hidden from view. It has to be brought out more and we have to talk about those more. So while you know, we know about some of those factors on the known side and we know how to fix them, we have to learn how to fix this there too. It's huge. It's, it's shocking that, you know, I remember 30 years ago in law school learning about United States versus Brady and the fact that, you know, prosecutors have to turn over if they, if they find exculpatory evidence that could help the defense, they must share it with the defense. And I thought, Huh. That's, I remember I was young, 24, 25 years old hearing this. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, lawyers, and I'm a first year law student, right? Crim law, crim pro thinking, well, lawyers in general want to win their side of the case, right? I mean, I don't care who you are. You want to, you want to win. And if you're a prosecutor and you have something that's going to help the other side, who's going to force, how, 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 where's the transparency to kind of turn that over? I remember sitting in my seat and thinking that that is fraught with problems sure. because prosecutors are supposed to want to seek justice, but most prosecutors are going to want to win at all costs. And I, I can't believe that there's nothing has ever come up that the prosecutors do have to turn over their files do have to open up after a conviction, before a conviction, sign something, swear under oath that this was, that there's no exculpatory evidence. Right. It's, it's shocking that the laws haven't changed um, to force it. It's still shocking that, that police and judges and prosecutors all have immunity for the, for their bad mm -hmm. doings. Sometimes there's some gross negligence that you could you know, gross misconduct that you can skirt some of those laws, but not for prosecutors, not for judges. I mean, it's near impossible, right? Near impossible. It's uh, very difficult. But I remember, so on the Brady question, it's even more difficult than that. Because it, if you remember from your law school days, and I don't remember much. So please <laughs> teach so me. remind it's, me. It's, so it's not just that they have to turn over exculpatory evidence, which is evidence which tends to show you know, cut against guilt and also impeachment evidence. So evidence that could cut against the credibility of a witness, it has to be material, right? There's that word material, Objective. which is in Brady. And that means that it's not just all ex exculpatory evidence. It's just exculpatory evidence that if I don't hand it over now and the guy gets convicted, could have made a difference in that conviction down the line. And the prosecutor so, makes that decision. Exactly. His own evidence. Exactly. I mean, so you have prosecutors looking to determine whether something is exculpatory when they're not trained in looking at the case from the defense side. So they may not even recognize it. And then they have to make this second determination. Well, but is it material? Why go through that? Just have them turn over the whole files. That's the decision they made in Texas. That's Texas, the word. They got to get rid of that word. The entire state of Texas is open file discovery hmm. by law. They ha And they haven't stopped prosecuting people in Texas. You know, there's their criminal legal system is still rolling along just fine. Hmm. Right? I didn't North know, Carolina I didn't... requires open file. Same thing. They're still last I checked, they're still arresting and prosecuting people in North Carolina. In New York State, if a prosecutor has to sign an, a, an agreement that says, yep, I gave over all the exculpatory evidence I have. If they don't, they can be prosecuted for for violating a court order. Right. So there are we're starting to see some mechanisms be put in place to try to check that. But it's very few. Mm. We need much more of it. But you're but it doesn't have the negative impact people think it will. It just doesn't. And they get to sit the sit. I mean, for our listeners who don't really understand this it, like, the, the, and tell me what I, if I'm, any part of this is wrong. But the prosecutors interview a witness. They come across a piece of evidence. And say, eh. This wouldn't help the defense. This isn't material. I don't think I should turn this over. And if I get caught, I'll just argue that it wasn't material. 
Right. I, and I, basically, it doesn't that, even have to be that intentional. It could even simply be you're talking to an eyewitness getting a, and they say, well, I saw this. Um, it's not the guy that you, you have. I saw somebody else. And the prosecutor can look at that. Well, you know, this person was 50 feet away or 100 feet away. They couldn't possibly have seen it. They're just mistaken. Right. And so they kind of can rationalize it looking through the lens of I got the right guy. Right. So it's, it's a concept we talk about called tunnel vision that you're looking at it through the prosecutor's eye. They think they got the right guy. Anything that doesn't point to that is probably unreliable or otherwise can be explained away. And instead of having to put those decisions in the hands of the prosecutor, if we make it open file, then they don't have to make that decision anymore. It's just provided. And we provide for things like victim safety and eyewitness safety and, and by redactions and all kinds of you know, caveats that go on the defense counsel who gets that information so we can protect it and still provide it. There's no reason not to. Shocking. It, I agree with you. It's just, it's shocking that they could make that call that, that, you know, something that obviously could be helpful. Uh, let, let the defense interview that witness who sees them and says, you got the wrong guy. But the fact that they don't have to turn them over in most states is really upsetting. One of the gentlemen in those pictures behind me, a um, man named uh, Sean Thomas, when we worked with the Conviction Integrity Unit of that case, they went and pulled the police file. The first thing they found was a manila folder with 28 pages of witness statements that had never been turned over to the defense at trial. Those statements included a confession from another individual who actually had a motive to commit the murder. None of that had been turned over to defense. None of it. The police just decided that was not a viable suspect and they continued their investigation. That's not their call. And they don't get to make that decision. Let me guess. It, the prosecutor, the police officers, the detectives, nobody was held accountable. Nobody was punished. I wouldn't say not punished. Uh, well, that's true. They were not punished, although it, there, ha there was a civil rights um, lawsuit that was settled just yesterday. Oh. on the case, but you're right. There, there is no accountability. But for those that. people are still working. I mean, if they, uh, if they haven't retired, they worked until retirement. They, they didn't go to jail. They didn't get prosecuted <laughs> for putting this person in prison for how many years did you say? Uh, that was 28 years, 28 years. I, <laughs> I mean, it's mind blowing. Yeah. I hope you got a lot of money. Not nearly enough. No. Yeah, you're right. It could be a billion dollars and that's not enough right. money for sitting 28 years in prison for a crime but, that he didn't commit. I mean, it's it's right. But that's exactly where the CIUs are needed, because without the CIU, I never would have been able to see that police file. We never would have gotten that material. We never would have been able to make that argument because the CIU got involved and they got the file and reviewed it and gave it to us. We were able to make that resolution. That's one of the key issues with CIUs. They get information that may otherwise remain hidden and bring it to light. It's a shocking parallel of how many cases that go through a CIU or CRU, Conviction Review Unit, involve pro you know, withheld evidence, Brady material, what we call Brady material, withheld evidence. It's an extraordinarily high percentage of them. And, and I don't and know that's you, why they're I, necessary. I don't know about you, but I don't think that this is a, uh, a one-off. I mean, how many people are sitting in prison where exculpatory evidence wasn't turned over? Right. I mean, it has to be in the thousands. It could be in the thousands just in Pennsylvania. We don't know. Uh, and that's part of the difficulty with talking about wrongful convictions. We don't know what the rate is. We have no idea. You know, did, we have, we did you know, you know how many... For, you know, we know about it in automation. We and in the automotive industry, we know how many injuries per you know, certain number of accidents. We know how many you know, never events happen in the medical field. We have no idea what the number is in the criminal legal system. Was the prosecutor who did the right thing? Because, because remind you, somebody pulled this file, saw it, and yes. realized what they were turning over to you. Yes, I mean. Bombshell, is that a accurate statement? Uh, that's pretty close. Yes. <laughs> what he were handed it to me and he said, yeah, this, it's not even a question. This is Brady. And it was just, and, 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 and he was so shocked. 
was this a high up person in that department? It was the assistant direct uh, chief of the conviction review unit. And so it sounds like this person was what remorseful, aggravated, embarrassed, all of the above. And so, you know, is there any, you know, formal review now? Like, is it like, are they going to go back and look at that? Whoever handled that case 28 years ago and go through every single one of their files to see if there's people sitting in prison with exculpatory evidence, Brady evidence sitting in a file. That seems like that should happen. Well, in that case, we, I can't say the prosecutor even knew about that file because that was contained within the police file itself. It had never been turned over even to the prosecutors. They didn't have it. So in that case, it was it, probably an error on the police. But the issue is really anytime there's an exoneration, anytime we show there's a wrongful conviction, there should be you know, kind of what we call a root cause analysis done. We should sit down with that file and go through it intensely. And you know, with stakeholders, with folks from the prosecutor side, with folks from police, folks from the judges, folks from defense counsel, and look at it together. You know, no exoneration is ever one person. It's never one person. You know, it's never just a false confession because that detective took a confession and had to report to his supervisor who thought it was hunky-dory. And they had to provide that to a prosecutor who saw no error. They had to provide it to a judge who saw no problem or a jury or a defense counsel who did not defend that case well. It's always system problems. So whenever there is a wrongful conviction, we should be looking at those cases, doing a root cause analysis of what went wrong, coming up with a list of the errors and a list of solutions. And how are we going to fix this? And we've done that in the Malcolm Bryant case in Baltimore, several cases here in Philadelphia. And then we see the system can fix itself from learning from that error. And if we don't do that, we are missing a huge opportunity yeah. to make our criminal legal system more fair and just. Yeah. You're Monday morning quarterbacking it. I mean, it's that's, I agree. There should be a committee and you should learn from it and, and, and come up with new processes and procedures mm -hmm. to make sure this never happens again. Exactly. Let's talk, let's change gears and talk about, I know you've had uh, some experience with false confessions mm -hmm. and how, Tell our audience how often or how rare it is uh, for a false confession to be used in court cases. Well, in a false confession, so uh, let me start by saying the vast majority of people who give a confession to police, it's a true confession. They were involved in the crime and they are admitting their own responsibility and their own guilt. But in terms of wrongful convictions, where somebody is wrongly convicted of a crime, about 25% of those, the person gave a confession. And I don't mean just like, okay, I did it, can I go now? But detailed confession about a crime they know nothing about because they weren't there. And that number is actually- How does that higher. happen? How does that happen? It is it is crazy. So the way police are generally trained in the United States on how to interrogate suspects is driven toward getting a statement of inculpability, right? So I attended a training on this. I, I trained with police officers, I went through it. I understand the training. And the first part of the process isn't has nothing to do with the case. Nothing to do with the case. You sit there with the suspect and you're asking them questions like, you know, well, what do you think should happen to the person who did this? Right? How is that relevant to the crime? And depending on how they answer, if they say, oh, I think you should be thrown in jail, then I think, okay, he's probably not involved. If he says, well, maybe he had a reason, I should start to suspect him. Right. And then through a series of questions, through this behavioral and analytical process, I make a determination. Is this person involved or not involved? And if I determine they're involved, I flip into interrogation mode. And my goal of an interrogation is to get a statement. It is all geared toward that. And that could mean that I'm sitting And the first step of that statement, Mike, is I confront the suspect. I know you did this, Mike. I've got all the evidence against you. And you say, no, 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 I didn't. I don't even let you speak. I talk over you. No, we know you did it. We've got all this evidence. No, I didn't do it. Yes, you did. I have, And I, I keep pounding you until you stop denying. I was told, I was literally told, if that goes on for 20 minutes, I should rethink my process. Not because you might be innocent, but because I might be, be approaching you with the wrong way. Mm. So once a person's kind of broken down, 
and we've seen cases where people have you know, professed their innocence 27 times and that's been pushed back every time. Then we move toward forward. And the next step is, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to get you to talk about the case. And I could say something like, you know, Mike, I got your code in the next room. He's given it up on you. Or I found your DNA on the scene. Can you tell me why your DNA is on the ligature around her neck? I'm allowed to lie to you. Police can lie. There's nothing unconstitutional about that. Yep, yep. yep. Most other countries prohibit that here in the United States, with very few exceptions. We're fine with it. So by telling you things like that, you learn about the crime. You learn that there was a ligature. You learn how the person was shot. You learn all kinds of things. In the Brandon Massey case that, that was on the making of a murderer, huh? we all saw that video. This is a 17-year-old boy being interrogated by police, and they tell him, well, tell us what happened to our head. And, and if you remember in the movie, he says, uh, we cut her hair. He said, no, that's not what happened. Uh, we hit her in the head. And they go back and forth like this. And eventually the officer finally says, well, she was shot. Who shot her? And he said, oh, oh Steve did that. Well, why didn't you tell us that before? I didn't remember. They feed the information to the suspect. So that at the end of this process, they now know exactly how that crime was committed. They know all of the evidence about it, and they can write out a detailed confession to a crime walking into that room they knew nothing about. Is that poor kid going to sit in prison the rest of his life? God, I hope not. Not, not if Laura I Ryder and the folks at the Center for Wrongful Convictions have anything to do with it. They are dead committed to getting that boy out. He's not a boy. He's a man. Um Wisconsin so teams. Just, I mean, that was, I mean, brutal. A hundred percent brutal and cruel. And that was recorded. Imagine all the ones that are not. Right. So you asked how a false confession happens. That's how. That's, like, that's a great example. They I mean, just want it to end, or they get so exhausted that they're just they'll say anything. What's wrong with the judges in Wisconsin who saw? those tapes who watched the show, who watched the actual everything and, and they don't move. They're not moved by it. Like, like some people argue, Oh, that's it's in the editing, right? The editing makes it look, they, you don't, right. you didn't see half of it. I don't know how you on that particular case. I mean, the other, you know, his uncle's case, I, I I'm, I still think they're both innocent, but with Brendan Massey, there was like, how could there be any doubt? How did they convict? Yeah. How did they keep pushing? Um, how did the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, everybody's just ignoring this this, this guy who's who's got all the issues he's got? I mean. So I would say there's a couple answers to that. One is about bias. And I don't mean bias with a big B. I mean bias with a little B. Like your confirmatory bias. Because the courts believe he's a he's guilty. They go in there viewing all the evidence through that lens and they can't sometimes can't see it. But remember our criminal process is not set up to determine innocence, right? If you look through the constitution, I do this with my law students. You pull up the constitution, look through the word innocent doesn't appear there. It's nowhere in there. Our process is about guilt or not guilt. It's not about innocence. Mm. And all of our post conviction laws are not geared toward finding people who are actually innocent. It's about, was there constitutional error? And if the courts determined there was not constitutional error, even if the person is actually innocent, they will keep them in prison. And that should shock everybody. We do, our, you, some of our Supreme Court justices have famously said that you know, if the person's innocent, there's no constitutional barrier to executing them. And that it should chill anybody who is concerned about our system at all. That we have to respond to innocence. We have not. We have done so abysmally. But we need to be able to have our criminal procedures modified to be able to respond to cases of innocence. Here in Pennsylvania, if a prosecutor thinks a person is innocent, they do not have the power to walk into court to undo that conviction, mm. even though they're duty bound to do so. There's no mechanism for them to do that. And that's shocking. It's shocking. It there are the very truth. few states that allow that. It's absolutely. crazy. Yeah, it's absolutely. I think that's the technical legal term is it's crazy. 
I, I, yeah, the fact that, you know, I, you don't think I mean, the constitution's long, you don't think about the, in, the word innocence in there, but I didn't, I don't know if I knew that or remember that, um, that our constitution doesn't really care about innocence. And, and, nope. and cause I do remember reading some opinions, you know, going through these processes where the justices in a certain state or certain case do believe the person's innocent, but they don't have the means to be able to overturn it, which is horseshit as you and I, that's also a technical legal term. Very technical legal term. Wow. You learned that in your third year of law school. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, these false confessions. So obviously, we're, you know, I think most states now have the fact that they have to be videotaped. Is that true? Um, I don't think most. Uh, it's a growing number. Some states do require it by statute, but more and more police departments are voluntarily taking it on. And of the you know, several hundred uh, departments around the country that do it, none have gone back. None of them have said, you know what, we changed our minds. We're not doing it anymore because police see the value in it and they want it to happen. So it's just a matter of getting there more and more. It's um, unbelievable. Um, Eye opening. I hope everybody listening and watching see the gravity of what's happening and that if you're called to testify, if you're called to be a witness, if you're called for jury duty, I mean, that's why we do these, right? Um, mm -hmm. that, that's just to, just to bring awareness. And if people want to learn or need your help, how do they get a hold of you, Marissa? How, do, how, um, can they learn about the great work that you guys are doing down there? Sure. So for on the conviction integrity unit side, go to convictionreview.net and learn about some of the resources that are available there and what a good unit is, because people need to be, need to understand what a good unit is to be able to challenge their own prosecutor's office if they don't have one or if they're not doing it right. And then, of course, for our center, it's quattronecenter.org is all the work that we do. And, and the conviction integrity is a very, very small part of that. Mm. What you know, the others who are much smarter than me do, who work with our center, um, really are about using data to inform criminal legal process decisions, whether that's on decisions about early bail or in, on um, probation and parole issues or uh, working on police misconduct issues or others. You know, we, we work with stakeholders all around the country to try to bring a more data-driven understanding in the criminal legal system. Kind of a new concept. Mm -hmm. I know it's because we don't use data in the criminal legal system. I, I, not in the criminal legal system. In the civil practices, we use data all, all the time. time. But, but not in criminal. And I think that's really interesting. Right. And uh, We don't make decisions for statutes and laws based on data. We, based on this is how we got mandatory minimum sentences. There's no data that said we need to keep people in prison a certain amount of time in order to have them you know, pay their debt to society or get, it was all about anecdotes, right? We want to feel better about ourselves. Let's have mandatory minimums. You know, and now we know from the data, they don't work. And so we have to undo those. And so we need to start being driven more by data in our criminal legal system. And that's a big part of what the Crotchroom Center is all about. Love it, love it, love it. Um, I just got a note from uh, Kevin that uh, Pete Lucido, our new Macomb County prosecutor, has, has spoken publicly about opening a conviction integrity unit as well. So put him to your, put him on your list. Karen gonna, Ronald, tell him Mike Moore sent you. Uh, I'm going to email him as soon as we're done and I'll tell him that you sent me. And uh, wow, this has been eye opening. Really, really good interview. Thank you, Marissa Bluestein. I really appreciate you being on our show, educating me, educating our audience. And um, this was really, really great. So thank you. Well, I appreciate your time. Happy to come back anytime. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Wow. I learned a lot on that one, everybody. And I hope you did too. If you know somebody who needs to hear more about conviction integrity units or innocence projects, um, Check out our show notes, like this episode, share this episode, and comment as you usually do. We really appreciate those. I like to read those and see what you like and what you don't like and what you thought of everything. So thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next time on Open Mic.